order to justify the military industrial complex. Now, from our point of view, as social justice activists and peace activists and uh, international uh, human rights lawyers like Ramsey Clark or uh, civil rights lawyers like Mara Verhaden Hilliard, uh, we have another argument that we'd like to present. There are 30 to 40 million Americans who are either unemployed or underemployed. One out of four Americans is food dependent, meaning they are hungry. Nine million families have been evicted from their homes because they couldn't pay their mortgage. American students, when they get out of college, have a debt that will last them a whole lifetime. And its amount of student debt to the government and to banks in the United States is one trillion uh, dollars, one trillion. And instead of spending a trillion dollars each year against an enemy that does not really exist, instead of spending a trillion dollars to maintain an artificial war that we say to the U.S. government uh, that speaks in our name, as Mara said, speaks in our name, that we would prefer to use the money for jobs and housing and education and health care rather than to endlessly threaten the Korean people. Now, Michelle and I agree on one thing, uh, many things, but one thing for sure is that U.S. troops should leave uh, South Korea right now. But should it be a precondition? Should it be a precondition for pressure on the U.S. government to sign a peace treaty? I would say we don't want to give the U.S. government any excuse whatsoever for not signing a peace treaty right away. The peace treaty only means the war has come to an end. And once the peace treaty comes, the rest of the issues can also be discussed and evaluated. Will their dream of carrying out regime change happen in DPRK? Will that happen? I think no. North Korea has weathered the worst part of the storm uh, in the 1990s. You could see, as we saw today, the country is strong. The economy is getting stronger. The people are educated. The people are trained. The one thing that North Korea doesn't have is access to international trade because of the economic sanctions imposed by the West. And if Korea were able to be reunified, especially as an independent country, and that's what Michelle is for, and that's what we are all for, an independent reunification, the Korea will be a powerhouse. The Korean people and the Korean nation will be a powerhouse in the modern world, and we believe will be a powerhouse not just in an economic sense, but a powerhouse in terms of its advocacy for peace and self-determination and foreign policy based on mutual respect rather than domination. Once and if the foreign forces such as the United States leaves Korean Peninsula once for all, then the Koreans from all ends, north and south and overseas, as the whole world has witnessed during the Kim Dae-jung and Roh Moo-hyun period of 10 years, Koreans are fully ready and capable to bring about our peaceful and self-determined reunification very soon. So I, I hope we answered your, the gentleman's question. Hopefully the three of us made it. Okay, next move. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next question. Um, Sorry, I, are, you, are you with the working press? Forgive me, you are, yes, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Nancy Snow. I'm a blogger with the Huffington Post. Oh. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to ask, I'm also an Abe fellow at Keio University. I'm doing a project on uh, Japan's image in the world. And I'm addressing, of course, the tensions in the region it seems to me you've got a problem here of competing propaganda images. Uh, notably, when Dennis Rodman went to the DPRK earlier this year, it was almost cartoonish, the coverage of that trip. He went with Vice magazine, the online website as well. And it was an opportunity lost to learn about what life is like for the people in Northern Korea, to give them a human face. So we in the U.S. have a propaganda image, and, in, and then I believe, although I haven't been to North Korea, what was your experience when you talked to the people there? What was their impression 
of the U.S. because we, we, have, we don't have an accurate representation. And, and you speak so articulately about this horrible corporate welfare and all of this waste over 60 years and an opportunity lost over decades. But how do we overcome these competing propagandas if we are going to get a wellspring of grassroots and global grassroots support for peace and reconciliation because I think at our core we're supportive of that but we have to talk back to the politicians and the policy makers and we can't do that without getting beyond the propaganda images. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Clark, you've hardly spoken at all. Would you like to make a brief comment on that? Or, uh, <coughs> um, the U.S. has had um, it's, uh, you might say, Far Eastern bases in the Philippines since the Spanish-American War. And it seems uh, obvious just from events that a primary interest of the United States at the end of World War II was to have half of Korea up to the 38th parallel. Uh, strategically, it's, an, it's a vital place. We demanded, went in and took it. There's no legal, moral, or even political justification for it. And, um, you know, with long-range nuclear weapons, I'm not sure the, the meaning of it anymore, but I can tell you at that time, uh, our intention was to have a base um, behind Japan, in front of China, and, and below Russia, the Soviet Union at the time. And we wanted to tip into that, um, a big tip in, where we could have a safe base and uh, and hung on to it through the years um, as conditions changed. And the experience has been cruel beyond measure for the Korean people. It should never have happened and should be ended last week or sooner. Okay, thank you very much. Um, who else would like Mr. to... Mara, mm? just, just Mr. Mara, Mara, sorry. Just, uh, just, 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 <laughs> to give a brief response to the question, the, the one thing that, that we experienced as we, as we walked around and, and, and talked to people and met with people and people in parks and, and just the, the welcoming nature that we as people from the United States were willing to come, that we had made the effort to come, that we too wanted peace was very clear and, and we were very appreciative of the in incredibly welcoming and kind nature of people. People also made it, the people of, of, of the DPRK also made it extremely clear that there is, there, there is a vast understanding and knowledge actually of what the United States, of what the government is doing, far more than what the people of the United States have in terms of an understanding of the DPRK. And that there is, there is a distinguishing between the people of the United States and the government of the United States. And an understanding that the government of the United States that is carrying out these acts and doing this is doing it really without the knowledge uh, and, and the acknowledged consent of the people of the United States. And, and I I was very grateful for that recognition and awareness as well. And that's a, that's a reality. But that core message was an extreme desire for peace, that people want to have peace, that they want this war to end, but that people are absolutely going to stand up for their right to live with you know, sovereignty and dignity, and that they will not tolerate from the U.S. government, as they should not have to tolerate from the U.S. government, a, a continuing abuse and abusive conditions. And so it was a very um, important message of strength, of a desire for peace, and a welcoming appreciation for the people of the United States and the people of the world who all of us want peace. It doesn't serve us when the governments acting in our name or conducting constant exercises towards war. Thank you. Any more comments from any? If not, we'll move on to the... Um, I'd like to just put in a quick question that myself here, and that is that you're here in Tokyo now, you're in Japan, so what essentially is it you think Japan could do or should do most to contribute to the signing of a, of a peace agreement between the, the two parts of, or the, the parties involved? Um, Dr. Chost Um, <clears throat> I, 
I think that Japan has to reflect on its own history in relation to the United States of America, and I'm talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, because in effect, crimes against humanity were committed against the Japanese people in the same way as they were committed at, at, in a later stage against the people of Korea. Uh, Japan's, Japan still hosts US military facilities, and the history of, of the Second World War is being distorted. We know now uh, that, in fact, I should put it differently, the Truman administration knew as early as April 1945 that the Japanese imperial government was seeking to surrender the United States. That was known, and it was corroborated by US intelligence at the time, and it was ignored. And many uh, prominent uh, political figures, including President Eisenhower, condemned uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, saying that it was totally unnecessary, and it certainly was not it was a mechanism to, uh, to kill tens of thousands of civilians and to terrorize a country into submission. And I think the best way to confront, the, to confront and to pursue, to confront the United States and to pursue uh, the objective of peace in East Asia is to reflect on the criminal role played by the United States against the people of Japan. I, I recall, and these are foreign policy lies which have to be underscored, that when President Truman made his radio address on uh, August 9th, the day when Nagasaki was being bombed, but he reported essentially on Hiroshima, his words were, the world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. And that was because we wanted to save the lives of innocent civilians. I quote in substance, but you can verify the quotation. So my message to the people of Japan is solidarity with the people of Korea and get, your, get the US troops out of Japan uh, because in effect your country is also under US military occupation and withdraw from any kind of Asian pivot which consists in extending U.S. military hegemony and threatening countries of the region including China and Russia um, which are also trading partners with, with Japan. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Very, very much to the point. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment on Japan's contribution? No. May, All right. I, may I? Yeah. As a Korean. Yes, please. Yes, uh, though I'm, I have a U.S. passport. As a <laughs> Korean uh, the, in addition to Professor Chustovsky, the point on the Japanese reflection on its past in regard to the United States of America, but also its past to the Koreans during the colonial period, which Japanese government hasn't yet, specifically the Abe, the administration in regard to particularly the military slave history. But let, let that be the past once the Japanese government honestly come forward to, to regret and begin to compensate for those victims. But even that as a past, for the sake of the future, I mean the Japanese positive, constructive role for the future of not only Japan but also the whole region, including Korean Peninsula is, as we all know, I believe the Japanese economic power 
has begun with the Korean War, which in 1948 fall, already military factories in Japan were re, re, re begun to, to produce weapons of the mass destruction were brought to Korean War. So many as argue, the Japanese economic power base began at the expense of Korean bloods. If, if that's the fact that the Japanese population may agree with, then I, I, uh, I sincerely appeal to Japanese population, let's move on to the future. Not only your future, but also everybody's future for the region. And to join the millions of people around the world and the Koreans from North and South and overseas Koreans to aid in solidarity to bring about genuine peace in the Korean Peninsula and the region and the world, I believe that that's the one the Japanese population and friends and sisters and brothers in, Jap in Japan islands will be very proud and will be very much appreciated by the Koreans and around the region. So that's my comment as a Korean friend to many Japanese friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question over here. Let's Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Prem Shankar Jha. I'm from India. I'm a columnist of The Hindu and a former editor of The Hindustan Times, which is Delhi's main newspaper. Uh, I want to ask one question about where one goes from a peace treaty and how one goes from peace treaty to, to peace. And the reason I ask this is that I was in Korea in the mid-90s for several days with a group of scholars from Harvard. And we had a large number of discussions then, as you said, at a time when hopes were high. And there was a very clear design. What they said was, we will not make the, 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 the mistake of the two Germanys. There will be no reunification in that sense. Uh, that we would like to be able to take advantage, invest in North Korea and take advantage of the, 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 the low wages there and bring that upwards. And that in the process, gradually, the unification would be, in an economic unification would precede a political unification. And this seemed to me very, very sensible. Uh, what I was then surprised, rather depressed that five months ago after the last nuclear test, I think, or shortly associated with that, that the one single uh, economic zone that had been created in North Korea by South Korea was also um, closed down or at least they, they said they were going to close it down. Now, question is, is there any thinking along these lines about the future? Because among other things, the nuclear threat that North Korea poses would vanish the instant that there was an economic integration between the two parts. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, we... There will be many speculative answers to that question, and they'll be just that, purely speculative. Uh, and you can just spend a few minutes and start to think through a number of scenarios uh, along that line. But I think, I think that we have to stay focused, in a way, on what's before us. And I think it's extremely important because we know, for instance, that there could be unification of Korea under the domination of the North or under the domination of the South, depending if one had completely conquered the other during the course of military conflicts. Sixty-three years after the start of the Korean War, that's not happening. DPRK is strong. It, I think, the United States believed that they could take down the DPRK in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc nations. That turned out to be a fantasy. South Korea is not going to vanish or disappear. There are two different governments, two different social systems based on the way the economic uh, systems, the mechanisms of the economy are organized. The biggest single problem now is really the absence of a formal peace treaty because none of the discussions about what the future of Korea could look like can go forward 
until this, uh, until this happens. What will happen if a peace treaty is signed? Does that mean that there will be automatic reunification? Obviously, no. What it does mean, though, with almost 100% certainty, is a dramatic reduction in tension. A dramatic reduction in tension between the US and the DPRK, and consequently between North and South Korea. From our point of view, from the point of view of activists and people of conscience in the United States, our position is this. Only Korean people can determine the future destiny of Korea. But right now, the government, as Mara said and as Ramsey said, the government that speaks for us, spends our tax dollars, sends our young men and women uh, to occupy southern Korea, that government uh, is the obstacle to the ability of the Korean people to choose whatever road they so choose in the future. And it's time for the U.S. government to get out of the way. And the way that starts to happen is to have the peace treaty because the peace treaty, as I said in my presentation, the politics are based in Washington, not Seoul and not Pyongyang. If the peace treaty comes, the Korean people will automatically begin the discussion of what the future in Korea looks like, free of all of this tension and free of the endless threats. And every time there's another incident, every time North Korea, for instance, sends up a satellite, which 60 other countries did in 2012, but only North Korea had a UN resolution directed against it for carrying out a legal satellite launch. Or any time Korea, in response to the simulated and mock nuclear destruction of Pyongyang, does another nuclear test, each and every time, North Korea will be labeled in the United States and by the United States media as the ultimate provocateur, the ultimate aggressor, the ultimate bad guy, the ultimate rogue nation. And this cycle will repeat over and over and over again. The cycle needs to stop. And it can stop not by speculative plans about the future, but what can happen right now, which is the peace treaty. Um, can I just clarify something? Would the parties to the peace treaty be the same parties that signed the armistice agreement? And, and, and who would they be? Who essentially the, the, in 1953 or now? Yeah. Well, no. In uh, no, will it be the same? Same, now? same now. In other words, yes, yes. And the, during the Kim Dae Jung and Kim Jong Il historic summit meeting, thereafter on, the those South Korea is not official signatories in 1953 was invited to attend at the four-party peace treaty signing ceremony, most likely if and when it takes place in Panmunjom. But it's officially, the legal term is the DPRK, together with the China and the United States of America. UN is not party to the agreement, as UN Secretary General Office okay. mentioned. All right. yeah. And uh, very, very quickly, if I may, in a peace, if a peace treaty were signed, what would North Korea have to agree to in respect of its nuclear weapons? What would be the minimum requirement of on? Um, well, North, North Korea could say to the United States, in order to sign a peace treaty, let's both disarm. Uh, but that's not realistic. The United States has thousands of nuclear weapons. They're not going to throw them away. Uh, we don't believe that DPRK at this moment is intending to get rid of its nuclear weapons either. The nuclear weapons issue is a separate issue from the peace treaty. The okay. peace treaty can be a clean, simple document, meaning that the Korean War is legally, technically come to an end, that the countries are at peace instead of at war, and that the normalization of relations okay. through bilateral discussions can take place on all matters. Thank you. I'll just take one yeah. final question, very briefly. A uh, question over here, I think. Um. Good afternoon. I speak uh, as a private citizen and a, 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 an associate member of the club, David Satterwhite, uh, with a PhD in Korean politics as well. Uh, I think that the effectiveness of the um, panel and its efforts would be enhanced uh, by a further deepening of historical, a couple of historical uh, approaches and facts. 
uh, for instance, if we uh, appealed to the United States, if we appealed to the United States both on the basis of historical responsibility at the time of a, a presidency that has a Nobel Peace Prize, um, that there is an opportunity for a paradigm shift in looking at the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the U.S. Politici pol pol political approach is heavily uh, based... Since I, I'm can getting, you phrase it as a question? I'm going as to briefly as possible. Thank you. Sorry. I'll do that. Let's say what do you think at the end. <laughs> um, just what I meant by the bit, bit of historical, and I'll come to the question quickly. Um, August 6th, we all know. August 9th, we all know. The Soviet Union entered the war August 8th, and on the evening of August 10th, two young colonels were sent in the back room in, in the Department of War. Uh, Colonel Dean Rusk, later Secretary of State. Speak up, please. Because Colonel Dean Rusk and Colonel Charles Bonesteel, later commander of, uh, of the so-called United Command, to come up with a, a line on the Korean Peninsula. The U.S. proposed the division as a temporary division to accept the, divi uh, the surrender of the Japanese. The United States proposed the div div division. Uh, Soviet troops were already in Vladivostok ready to walk, and they did, and they waited three weeks on the 38th parallel until the U.S. could arrive. Historical fact. Second, uh, five years after Hiroshima, in the early months of the Korean War, single B-29 bombers over Pyongyang, Operation Hudson Harbor, dropping dummy nuclear weapons, scared the North Koreans. To this day, we say 5,000 uh, key North Korean facilities are deep underground. They were scared. And you've already mentioned the historical presence of American nuclear weapons, uh, 1953 at least, to 1991 or three, um, and so on. The historical opportunity of a paradigm shift. Uh, and so uh, I would challenge uh, in the question how to be more effective in getting this mo um, uh, message across. It comes across rather stridently, and we need to be very convincing and uh, okay. to approve that. How would you be more convincing in your approach? Thank you. Who's, who's like, who would like to take I that? Think Michelle was eager to uh, speak. Please, by all means. I have to put the message over less stridently and more effectively. I just, I just make a comment. I don't believe in paradigm shifts, okay? Because the real world is not based on paradigms, it's based on fundamental economic political relations. And it's not by just saying, I would like to have a new paradigm that things are going to change. Uh, we have the military industrial complex, we have a 32 billion nuclear weapons program, uh, we have the Asian pivot. In other words, what has to be uh, implemented are major shifts at the policy level and forget about the scholars with their paradigm shifts. I, I mean, I'm a, an economist and I tell you that the paradigms are pretty much utopian fabrications. But it, we have to look at the real world and then formulate paradigms perhaps in relation to those, to those options and strategic uh, relations which exist with, within the real world. Briefly, briefly, thank you. Yes, I, I'll be um, I'll be I'll be softer on those who advocate for a <laughs> paradigm shift. But um, the the reality is, if the DPRK was weak today, if they had become additionally impoverished, uh, if there were splits within the leadership of the DPRK that were visible to the outside world, in other words, if the DPRK's relative relationship of power in terms of its uh, internal situation and its relationship with Washington, there would be no chance for a peace treaty. Because the United States would not want a peace treaty, would not seek and see any interest for itself as an imperial power in this part of the region uh, to uh, do anything other than to destroy North Korea. Their real goal was regime change, as it was in Iraq and as it was elsewhere. But the reality is somewhat different. DPRK has become uh, stable, strong, economically growing. The, and if you watch the US media, they'll say 
China and the DPRK are now virtual enemies. But as we saw in Pyongyang on July 27th, the Vice Chinese uh, Vice the Chinese Vice President was in the same box with Kim Jong Un, uh, and it and all the Chinese volunteers who participated in the Korean War were honored guests and honored over and over again. DPRK still has a relationship with the People's Republic of China, and it's still a strong relationship. For these reasons, the United States has to acknowledge that their effort to carry out regime change are simply a fantasy, and that the best thing to do now would be to acknowledge this and to have a peace treaty so that uh, normal relations can take place between the DPRK and the United States. And for the people of the region, for the Japanese people, for the Korean communities in Japan who have their own problems with racism and discrimination, with the peoples in Japan who are uh, seeking to oust U.S. bases from, the military, uh, from, the, from their own country, for the people of China who recognize that the so-called Asia pivot is in fact a menacing act by the Pentagon against China, for the people of the United States who are so sick and tired of endless war, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, after Vietnam and Korea, the American people don't want any more war. We want peace too. And we have to be able to say in the clearest way, maybe it's strident, but maybe that's just because we're passionate and feel strongly about it. But this government must change course. It must change its policy. It must sign a peace treaty. And there must be, as Mara said, a way to turn the page, to enter a new era in US DPRK relations. OK, thank you. I'm afraid we'll have to um, call it and uh, call an end there. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers for a very robust, I thought, and interesting discussion. Um, we hope at some point, um, either at the end of your seminar or at some other point in the future, you'll all come back to the club. And to um, provide you with an incentive, we'd like to give you all a one-year honorary membership, which I will proceed to do in a moment. But in the meantime, thank you very much for all of, all of you for a very good discussion. Thank you. We have our business cards here for anyone who wants to get it. Leave here. And Mr. Sorry. Becker, and every, we are our business cards. I have all those <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, oh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was at uh, Qinghua in uh, fall of 07. I worked with Andy Dow in public diplomacy. Yeah, I didn't bring yeah. cards. You know, Lee Xinghua. Very nice. He's my good friend. Oh, yeah. I've just seen my, uh, my fun card. Yeah.